Hello, you're watching Global Insight, where we speak to experts from around the world on, to hear their views on issues making headlines. I'm Oz Young. Now, it's not an exaggeration to say that modern life is driven by technology, from communication and mobility to finance and driving economic growth. Today, we discuss some of the biggest trends in tech that will affect our lives and livelihoods in 2023. And for this, we're joined by Stephen Fennick, editor at Tech Guide, and Tongsu Eric Kim, adjunct professor of international studies at Hanyang University and founder and CEO of Data Crunch Global. Very warm welcome to you both. And well, my first question goes to you, Stephen. Now, it's that time of year when you're packing your bags to go to CES, uh, which is actually where we met the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, really, which really uh, sets the trend for, um, for tech that following year. And well, what are the top three gadgets that you're most excited about seeing at CES in January? Yeah, uh, good morning. Yeah, it is. I'm looking forward to going to CES. There's, I think the, the things we're going to be seeing, uh, I think VR is going to play a big role this time, virtual reality, especially with companies like already, well, Meta is already involved. HTC are rumoured to have a, a consumer level VR device. There's strong rumours also Apple will be joining the VR world as well. So uh, that, I think that will, that will play a big part in bringing it to more people's attention. Uh, I think electric vehicles are also going to be quite prominent. Uh, the consumer electronics show over the past few years has become just as big an automotive show as it has a consumer electronics show. And I think this time it will be no exception. There will be a whole range of advances in EVs as adoption of EVs, including right here in Australia, in, it, the adoption is really increasing year on year. But there's one product I'm really curious to see, uh, and that is the Dyson Zone. Dyson released, uh, they announced this product back in March, and I initially thought this was an April Fool's Day joke, but apparently it is not, a, it's real. It's coming out to, coming out in the US, Asia, and Europe next month. And this is a noise canceling headphones with a, an attached air purifier. So that, that will be on display there. I'll be very curious to see that uh, firsthand as well. Oh, wow. Well, I'm sad to be missing out, but I'll have to uh, keep up with Tech Guide to really um, you know, keep up to date with the new developments at CES. And well, Eric, now we've had a lot of, um, we've had the word metaverse time and time again over the past two years. And well, it's been something of a buzzword that we continue to hear. And do you think it's going to become more ingrained in our lives in 2023? Oh yes, Metaverse was indeed a buzzword symbolized by the corporate name change of Facebook to Meta. Uh, we must understand that the techno technological invention and adaptation are two different things. For example, electric vehicles were invented about 100 years ago, but it was only recent that we adopted the technology and it has been commercialized. This means that it takes time to build the technological regime and individual and social demand for the technology. Metaverse has a long way to go, mainly in three points. First, we need to advance the telecommunication and computing power to run Metaverse. Probably a Metaverse will run perfectly on a 6G technology and it is yet to come for implementation. And the main reason why we conceptualize Metaverse as an animated form is because it is too expensive to create a real world like Metaverse as a service with current technology. Second, we need further development for a keen business model uh, for Metaverse, and that has a long way to go as well. Third, we also have limited understanding and agreements on how to deal with fake identity and the um, cyber crime issues that might arise on Metaverse. So um, once we have a clear idea of these three points, then Metaverse can emerge as a dominant um, economy and a technology. Right, I see. And in terms of the sort of trends we're going to see in 2023, well, Stephen, you always get a preview of these really cool gadgets and technologies and of course you can't really tell us everything at this point but um, what buzzwords are going to make the uh, tech headlines of 2023? Well I think uh, smart is a, is a word that's been used at the Consumer Electronics Show for as long as I've been attending but I think in 2023 it's going to go a step further with the introduction of matter 
Matter is this new standard that we adopted by all companies so that it will allow different brands to operate together. So if your smart home ecosystem can now feature numerous brands rather than the one brand that will only be compatible. Think of Matter as uh, similar to Bluetooth. You, you hear about products that it can connect via that common connection, Bluetooth. So imagine the smart home devices in 2023 onwards being have, having that same that same standard or that same compatibility which in turn is just going to send the the market through the stratosphere it's going to really increase sales as the ease of connecting smart home devices increases I think another another big buzzword we're going to be hearing at CES is sustainability. A lot of companies are now just as competitive uh, on their green credentials as they are with their technological features of their products. So we're seeing where we're seeing a lot of companies now take spend, spending a lot of time and money to reuse materials, re recycle their products, to have their product to be 100% recyclable at the end of its life. Uh, so th these are the these credentials, this is the whole sustainability, closing the loop on their products and the, and the way they're manufactured and also disposed of is something we're going to be uh, hearing a lot about. You've also touched on metaverse. I think the, the whole VR presence and the metaverse as well, there's going to be a lot of companies at CES with their own products to enable the metaverse, the entry to the metaverse for a lot of customers. At the moment, there are only limited ways and limited, limited knowledge of the metaverse at this point. But I think as more products come to market, as more services even come to light, we're going to see hear a lot more about the metaverse in 2023. And Stephen, well, when it comes to tech, we obviously have very, uh, two very big players, uh, Samsung and Apple, and we're seeing a global rivalry between their ecosystems. It's something you can even see in my house. Uh, but well, which <laughs> ecosystem do you think is winning and what are the strengths and weaknesses of uh, both Samsung and Apple? Yeah, well, it is. It has uh, been a fierce competition between these two large companies. Uh, Samsung, their Galaxy ecosystem is very well known around the world. Samsung, of course, being the number one smartphone manufacturer in the world as well, so they have the advantage there. Apple really established their ecosystem, and people as customers are so loyal to that ecosystem as well. With the iPhone, the iPad, AirPods, all all these devices that make up that ecosystem. It's really it's it's very sticky with customers. It's very hard to. Get get out of that ecosystem once you're inside. But Samsung have come a long way also, and Samsung, I think, uh, apart from leading in the, in the whole, in the manufacturing, in the smartphone market, they, uh, they have a lot more variety in their range. And I think that's one of the reasons why they are the number one company is because they have a lot more variety, a lot more affordability as well. Apple tend to sell their products in the top end of the market, whereas Samsung have, have a range of devices starting from more affordable pricing all the way to flagship. Samsung also has more variety in their range, including their foldable smartphones as well. So in terms of choices, I think Samsung's winning the battle. Apple have that loyal, that customer loyalty that, that's not going away either. Oops, yes. Phone market, when it comes to their foldable devices, whether they're gonna even enter that market as well. I see. And of of course, uh, South Korea is home to Samsung Electronics and it drives the company drives a lot of our exports in the country. And Eric, well, how do you think the global economic conditions next year is really going to um, affect the tech industry, especially companies like Samsung Electronics? Okay. So the tech industry is de dependent on mainly two factors. First, um, it is dependent on the market demand, which we expect that the demand will slow down um, due to the economic recession. Second is the interest rate. Um, because the tech R&D is capital intensive, um, the interest rate, internal rate of return on investment of the R&D projects become lower when the cost of capital procurement, which is interest rate, rises. It is harder to find funding um, for the um, tech R&D projects with lower profitability and with high risk. Um, the tech market usually slows down. Uh, for Samsung Electronics, um, the smartphone and the electric, electronic goods market will really depend on the strength of their product. So there's a macroeconomic factor and also their 
product factor that will affect um, the profitability of Samsung. But when it comes to the semiconductor industry, we expect that um, the semiconductor industry will slow down due to the global recession. Um, in addition, Samsung is facing a fierce competition with TSMC, uh, which we expect that it's going to be a hard year this uh, next year. Um, during the recessions, um, there's a greater role for the government to support the tech industry with diplomat diplomatic arrangements. For example, we have to um, ha have a long dialogue with the U.S. government on the semiconductor industry and also for the Inflation Reduction Act. And another question to you, Eric. Now, Celsius, BlockFi, Terra, these are just some of the few uh, tech firms that uh, closed down this year. And of course, yeah. FTX uh, probably seeing one of the worst meltdowns. And well, following this string of scandals, um, mm -hmm. you know, investment into blockchain businesses, uh, they really slowed down this year. They suffered a lot. And well, how do you see the road ahead in the year of 2023? Yeah, I would like to first distinguish between crypto and blockchain. On the crypto side, we indeed saw a series of crypto-based financial intermediaries and hedge funds default, uh, triggered by the collapse of LunaCoin of Terraform Labs, and also highlighted by the default of FTX, a major crypto exchange platform um, that was valued around 32 billion US dollars in the last uh, fundraising in January this year. Um, the major argument of the crypto um, scene was that crypto can be a real value, especially as a medium um, of, for inflation hedging purpose. However, we clearly see that the crypto is a risky asset and um, probably um, the market understood that um, the value of crypto um, is still a questionable asset and it's also a very, very risky asset. And um, given that the contagion will continue going on next year. Um, so we will see a more crashes and defaults in 2023 in the crypto market. Right, I see. And uh, it looks like there's, a, there's are gonna be continued global uncertainties um, in the world economy, um, in markets. And well, turning to you, uh, Stephen, now is the in economic downturn that the world is uh, inevit inevitably going to face in 2023 and the decoupling from the Chinese market as well, um, affecting a lot of tech sectors. Uh, how do you see that really affecting um, technology in 2023? I think it's going to have a major effect uh, next year. The, the, the state of the economy, the uncertainty of the economy is really going to make customers question the need to upgrade devices, to buy new technology. So customers you'll find are holding on to their smartphones even longer. They're taking longer to update their TVs and other devices, tablets, laptop computers. So I, I think that's really going to affect those markets. Just, just in the smartphone market alone in 2022, I think it was a 9.1% drop year on year on, on demand. So, And that's due to a number of factors apart from the pandemic, but also these uncertain economic factors. Here in Australia, interest rates are rising month by month. Uh, so that is also having a solid effect as well. Uh, in terms of the uncoupling, I, I think this is going to be, it's going to have a dynamic effect on the, on the whole market in, in terms of the, the, the biggest, the biggest uh, export from China is the semiconductor business. And we already saw the effect of the pandemic, what that had on numerous industries, not just the tech industry, even the car industry really suffered during that time. So as these other countries form these new partnerships to manufacture those semiconductors, it's going to take a little bit of time for that to fall into place. So that uncertainty is going to create that doubt is really going to have an effect on the market. And I think people are going to be holding on to their money rather than spending it on devices. They're going to sort of wait. They're going to take the wait and see approach to make sure that uh, they, know, they know exactly where they stand. And they'll, they'll take their time, certainly, when it comes to upgrading those devices that we use every day, like our smartphones, TVs, laptops and tablets. And I want to hear your take on this as well, Eric. We're continuing to see disruptions to uh, supply chains, high interest rates and a general sense of gloom across the global economy. Uh, what is your outlook on the global business environment next year? Uh, I think that it's going to be a difficult year. Um, there are at least five forces that is influencing the global economy. Uh, the first one, of course, is the Fed's um, monetary policy increasing interest rates. 
uh, which we expect to continue for some time during next year. Um, this de decreases the money supply and slows down the economy in general. And second, the persistent energy and food security risk coming from the Ukraine war continues to threaten the global economy. However, at the same time, uh, we hope that um, the war situation you know, calms down and the um, reconstruction plan um, booms the global economy at the same time. A third, the international conflict and security risk um, levels may elevate due to economic recessions in um, regional levels. Fourth, Japan has started to raise its interest rates um, this month after a decade of quantitative ease. This means that the yen carry trade-based funds, um, which borrow yen at zero interest rate and invest in higher return assets such as U.S. bonds, uh, will be cleared. Um, this will trigger a greater downfall in the global assets markets, and so that will be a, another risk. Uh, fifth, the abandonment of the Chinese zero COVID policy will cause a greater um, slowdown of the Chinese economy with expected widespread of COVID. Um, on the supply chain side, we have to understand that the concept of make or buy decisions, we buy from our suppliers only when it's cheaper than making, um, making uh, it's cheaper than to make it by ourselves. The, gl the global economy is gradually transforming into an economy without China, having China shut down for three years now. We have to understand that this is how the market dynamics and resi resilience work. So we are expecting the global economy getting out of the uh, supply chain shock with this resilience. I see. Well, this is where we have to leave the conversation today. But if you want further insights on tech, techguide.com.au is the place to go. And you can even submit a question to uh, Stephen there. So, well, thank you very much for your time today. Stephen Fenwick at Tech Guide and Eric Kim at Hanyang University. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Also, thank you very much to our viewers for tuning in. Global Insight will be back tomorrow at the same time here in South Korea. So do tune into Airang TV then. Have a great day wherever you are. Goodbye.